Today I have with me Dominic, one of the lead maintainers of React Query, all the way from Austria. Dominic, thanks so much for spending some time with us here today. Hi, thanks for having me. In my previous video, we looked at some ways to do some refactoring of React hooks, mainly around the use of React Query. It looks like there's probably some better ways to do some of the things we did. So we're going to start here with the solution that I came up with in my last video. And let's talk through some of the things that we could have done better. My goal here was to kind of like abstract some of the complexity of a bunch of underlying hooks into something that I could use as a single hook in a React component. But what are you seeing here, uh, Dominic, is kind of some of the red flags that are standing out to you. What I usually like to do with these things is kind of just see it in the browser, see how it works, like start from the user perspective, what we actually want to achieve. Because a lot of the time when we look at the code and we start to see all the abstractions and um, especially when use effect is evolved, I always get a little bit like it's not a red flag because there are uses for it. But a lot of the time I kind of get my the senses uh, like up thinking like, is there a way to get rid of it? Because a lot of the time there is. And by getting rid of the use effect, we get rid of a lot of the complexity that it brings with it and the things that make it a little bit hard to understand. And often it also use effect comes, especially if you combine it with use state, it comes with additional render cycles that are probably not necessary. So maybe what we can do is take a look at the code that I started with and we can see, is there a way to improve some of that? This is kind of the code I started with at the beginning of my last video. It feels like there's a lot going on here. The fact that I've got like four different hooks that I'm calling because I can't put anything here in a conditional, I'm checking in multiple places to see if I'm dealing with the widget hooks or the gadget hooks. What do you think is maybe a good place to start with simplifying some of this? What stood out to me in the other solution was that we weren't actually calling use query anymore. That's a really important thing to do because use query is the hook that's going to create the subscription for your data that lives in the query cache. So without calling use query, when we just call use query client and then we get the data from it in an imperative way, our components will not re-render when new updates come in because React Query tries to keep our screen up to date. This is only possible with the use query hook. So that's why I kind of like this solution a little bit better, subscribing to both of these things, doing what React Query um, is good at. So let me quickly take a look into the use get widgets and the use get gadgets hook. So we are, this is basically just a, standard use query that is fetching both of them. Okay, so can we maybe with this, can we start with the browser and see the application, how it runs, what it's what it's, what it's it's doing? Yes, so this should be running the first version of this code. We have this widget and this gadget here exist in the local cache. These two do not. And so if we, uh, we can see them, this updating here. If we go to widget five, we see we have the post gadget five. We see we have the post as well. Okay. Well, then let's maybe start with the mutation itself because what I'm what I'm missing from the whole example was tying the mutations and the queries together. I think this is miss missing in uh, in both solutions because what we are doing with the mutation is firing it up and then when we get the result back, we are setting it into local state, saying, oh yeah, now you've you've selected the gadget five, for example. I often feel that mutation that the, the data that mutations get or that that use mutation actually does they're kind of ephemeral it's also the reason why use mutation doesn't share state around like use query does use mutation is basically just a small wrapper around making a request on demand and giving you back some ways to handle the loading and the error states and then obviously all the callbacks that are very handy to use. They're not really meant for taking the data and then working with it, like putting the data into local state or somewhere else directly. Because what happens is that once you get a refetch of your query, this data will not be in there. So if I have widget one and gadget three in my uh, query cache, and then I make a mutation that adds the widget five, on the server it will be added. So in the database, I now have three things. So at that point, what I want to do is I want to update my query cache in order to you know, have the correct state reflected in there rather than take what the mutation gives me and store that in state. And that's where we're kind of tying the, tying the loop together, that the mutation is just there to make the actual update, but it's not our state manager. That is what, what use query is. And there are basically two ways to, to make that happen. One way is that we can just uh, take the data that we get back from the mutation and then write it back to the query cache in the correct position. Or like if it's a list, we have to append it, for example, if we know that it was an add mutation and so on. That is the, the way that has the most amount of code, but it, it doesn't make an, an extra request. The simpler way is to just refetch the query. So you would just tell React Query, hey, I've added something to a list of things to a resource. Now please invalidate my cache and get me the latest resource. And after that, you have those things in the query cache, which means 
it doesn't matter that from the perspective of your application, only the first two things are in the query cache and the others are not. What we are doing is we're always reading it from the query cache. We're just trying to make sure that when we make the mutation, we actually do it and then we make sure that the cache is up to date. Yeah, that makes sense. For this to actually work, what I think I might want to do here is to kind of mock the idea of our database. If we just kind of create a array here yeah. and then we can just move these these items up to here. We have our, our hook set up to make it easy to like modify that state. We have our server state being updated accordingly. So why don't we look at the way that we would just refetch, trigger a refetch on on our queries. So the way this is working right now, we're actually like using the data that comes back from our mutations. But instead, we just want to re-trigger our queries here. So we'll, um, yeah. we can kind of drop this whole use effect, right? I guess that's the uh, that's the point to not put it into state, but to only kind of read it from the from the query cache. Yeah. So let's drop our use effect here. Like let's say the first time we look at this, you know, this data is not in our local cache, and then we want to actually trigger our mutations. What Do you have any patterns that you like for kind of using the mutation and then triggering these queries to happen? Yeah, so the, the standard approach to this is to use one of the callbacks on use mutation. So use mutation has the on success, on error, and on settled callbacks. And usually we could go for unsettled, which means whatever happens, you know, even if there's an error, get the latest data from the backend because we have done something. So we know something in the backend has changed. We can just do this on the custom hook and use mutation because use mutation takes another options argument as second uh, parameter exactly. And there we can call the unsettled callback. We call query client dot invalidate queries. And that is the main method of how I would like to interact with the query cache, which is just telling it which piece of data is now no longer valid. The invalidate queries method will then know automatically which queries it actually has to refetch depending on which queries are currently being used. So for the use post widgets, we can invalidate our widgets. For the gadgets, we can invalidate the gadgets and then we kind of have it have this full circle. Cool. And so we're just using the query key here and invalidating based on that query key. This query client reference that I have here is actually just the imported client. We're not using the use query client hook. Is there a best practice around like using the hook versus just importing that instance just directly? Yeah, so I usually always say, please use the use query client hook. And I think there's three reasons for it. When you're using server-side rendering, you're not creating the query client outside of your application, you're creating it inside the app component um, so that data isn't shared on the server between users. And then you can't import it because you can't export it. It's just like part of your, of your application. And also you have an easier time setting up for testing because if you have a query client that has different options for uh, production and testing, by just writing your code to always call use query client, it will always just read whatever is in the React component tree, what is in the nearest provider. So that means you can, in your test, wrap it in a provider that contains a test query client, while in your app, you're using the real one. Whereas if you just import it, your code is actually fully tied to the production query client that you have, and you have no chance of stubbing that out, basically. And then you go f you go to like jest.mock or whatever, and then it kind of gets ugly and yeah. Well, Absolutely. We'll awesome. All right. So we've got our, our mutation hook set up to properly invalidate the right queries. So we're calling this hook. If we look back at our uh, app TSX file, we want to be able to update this state here, right? Our data. Now we don't have this product anymore, right? Because we got rid of that local state. So is the best thing to do yeah. just to find it in our lists here, widgets.find or gadgets.find? Is that the is that the right approach here? I think. I think we are going to do that, but not from inside the mutate function, but right. inside the render function. And then we'll find out that we're missing one thing, but it's good because we're kind of like, we're going to see what we have to reintroduce. So if you're right. trying to do widgets.find, we'll see that we don't have the ID. And that brings us to like, what is our real minimal state representation? That is what the user has actually selected. So we yes. need to introduce some state back, but it's not going to be the full product. It's just going to be the selected ID. So we are going to we are going to need some some form of state, and this is really one of the best advices. Hopefully, I can give is that you should really try to find out what is the most minimal state that you can have and store that in state, and try to derive as much as possible from everything else that you have available. So that minimal state is the minimal state based on like the user's interaction with your application, and from that you can derive data like out of the cache that is within React Query. Is that the idea? Yeah, the minimal state is the minimal thing that you need to show your interface correctly and everything that you can compute, you do compute. Because if you take the full product and copy it into state, 
you will see that you have two versions of it. You have one version that lives in the use state and you still have another version of the product living in the array of widgets in your query cache. And then you have two versions of things. Either they get out of sync sometime, like when React Query does an automatic refetch, or you try to set up state syncing, like a use effect. If this changes, I copy it back to my local set. And then you're kind of creating all this complexity that is unnecessary if you just see the ID is the only thing I need and I can compute which widget I want. Gotcha. So there's a case here where we don't actually have any widgets at all. So I guess first we need a, a guard for that. We also have the case where we don't have a selected ID, right? So what? Yes. Um, instead of those guards, we could also just do like widgets question mark dot find, and then we just let it find the null ID, and and nice. this will just give us back undefined if there's nothing, right? So that's that that's also good. Perfect. And we can do the same thing here for gadgets. That I guess replaces. Yeah. One of those. Uh, and then I think we can probably like just drop all of these conditions in here. We're still not setting the ID right into into our selected state. So I think that's ah. that, that that's what's missing in the this mutate function that that we have. So that happens on the button click. And then we need to basically find out if we should run the mutation at all, right? Because if it's already in the cache, we don't need to. And this is basically the same thing that we have in line 76 and 77. We have like this find that tries to find them. So I will probably extract that to a function, get product or find product or whatever. Then we can call that in the function as well, just to determine like, do we have it already? Then we don't need to do anything. We just set the ID. React will re-render the component for us and it will then find it again and return it. If not, we have set something into state that doesn't exist yet. Our product will still be undefined, but then we'll fire off the mutation. And after that, eventually, you know, it will re-render with the new widgets that or gadgets that come back from the mutation. And then it will find it and pick it up. Gotcha. Okay. Now we can replace that with find product. So we can replace data here with product. And then after the set selected ID, we will probably just call find product again with the new ID. If we don't have it, then we fire the mutation. There is this great video from uh, David Kurushnit where he says, you know, most of your side effects and interactions should actually happen in event handlers and not in effects. And I think this is a very good example because here we already have the event handler and the side effect where we can easily know should we fire the mutation or not. And if we'd go to bind it to the render cycle, we would, for example, get into a situation with React 18 and strict effects where this would just fire again. This is something that cannot happen if you just uh, keep it in the event handler. Yeah, I feel like this approach definitely makes a lot more sense to me. When the user performs an action, that's when we do the work. We don't queue up a side effect to happen afterwards. So back here in the browser, so if we refresh this, our widget cache here only has those three items in it. And then if we go for widget five here, now we can see we've got four items. And then if we go to gadgets here, we can see the cache only has those three items in it. And then we can add our fourth one yeah. to it. And if we if we take another look at the hook, I think when we, when we look at the code, it's like, I think it shrunk a little bit, right? So there's like a bit of complexity Definitely. has gone away. And I think the duplication that you have now with widgets and gadgets, it's not that bad, right? So it's true, uh, yeah. We've gotten rid of many of the conditions that were in the original logic. I think by moving some of those conditions, some into like selector functions, like find product here, and then also by using unsettled to manage the updating of the state instead of doing it ourselves. Now we kind of have a, yeah. a much clearer pattern to read here. Yeah, I like that. I wouldn't change that much from here on, actually. One of the things I, I heard a lot from people watching the, the last video was that they would make this two separate hooks, one for widgets and one for gadgets. My take on that is that in our application code here or in our component, I kind of want to have a single handler here that I can use for all of my buttons, regardless of what that input from the user might be. And if I make those two separate hooks, I'm moving the complexity, I guess, out of this one hook, but I'm moving it up into my component. What's your take on that? I don't think that it would turn out too differently, actually. The part that's more important was to get rid of the uh, copying the product into the state and get rid of the use effect. And if we look at this yeah. now, I don't think it matters much, right? Because it's not that much code that you have. And you, you will always have a little bit of duplication with those two things. The only other thing that we could do is to actually make it one query. I think it's at least interesting to think about it because when we think about React Query and queries, we often think that it has to be one request. In the query function, if I want to make one request, I make one query key and one resource with one request. But it doesn't have to be that way. If we know that we want to actually work with products, 
and it doesn't matter that much that we have widgets and gadgets, then what we could do is we could have one use product hook that has one use query in it and the query function could actually make two requests and we would just get the things back and return both of them. And this has advantages and disadvantages, right? In your uh, solution, it might have a bit of advantage because you kind of want to treat them as the same. The disadvantage obviously is that those things are then bound together and they will always live together and they will update together. And so it means that if you create a widget, you will probably refetch widgets and gadgets if we invalidate them. Even though it's two requests, they are treated as one resource. This is kind of the trade-off to the situation, but it's something that can come in handy if that's what you want. If you only have separate requests because that's how the API is built, there is no need to separate them into multiple hooks. And I think that's a good thing to know and a good tool to have in your tool belt. That's really cool. For this application, we can say that like elsewhere in the app, we probably do use gadgets and widgets separately. And so this feels like the right separation. Well, this feels like a really great place to leave this. We've made some huge improvements. I feel like this hook, even though we still do have these four hooks, when I originally wrote this and had four different hooks being called in here, that felt like the complexity. But turns out the complexity was kind of elsewhere. And by managing our state a little bit better, using four hooks is not so bad at all. Dominic, thank you so much for walking us through this. Where can the people find you? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I am available on Twitter most of the time. So I go by the name TK Dodo online. I also have a blog at tkdodo.eu where I write about mostly about React Query, but also about other things, React and TypeScript. You can subscribe to it. It's a good place to stay up to date. Also with the developments that we do on React Query version 5, which is the new major version that we're working on. So whenever I'm deprecating some things on my blog and on Twitter, you're the, you would be the first to know. So if you want to keep up to date, that's the place. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.